last closing statement, at least uh, that way you can still get your question in if you decide to question. So, all right, so we have two eight-minute closing statements, and Mr. Ritchie, you have the first. Thank you, Mr. Augustine. Protestant scholar Howard Brown wrote on page five of his book entitled Heresy, Orthodoxy in the History of the Church, and I quote, it is impossible to document what we now call orthodoxy, referencing the Trinity, in the first two centuries of Christianity. By this, Mr. Brown affirmed that there were no true Trinitarians within the first two centuries of the Christian era, believing in the so-called orthodoxy of the later Trinitarian creeds. Today I have presented sufficient historical evidence to substantiate my claim in my thesis in which I affirm that the majority of the earliest Christians that lived during the first 300 years of Christian history did not believe in a co-equal and co-eternal son as defined in the later 5th century Athanasian Creed. I cited Tertullian's apology against Praxis III to prove that the Christian majority was always modalistic monarchian in theology during the 2nd and 3rd centuries of Christian history. I cited Roman Catholic historian uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman to prove that the majority, the Cardinal said that the, the word majority in his writing, of the earliest Christians were patripassian or modalist in the mid third century, and that the modalists were still very prevalent into the early fourth century. I cited Hermas and Clement of Rome to show that the earliest first century Roman church was modalistic monarchian. I cited Methides and Ignatius, who both were taught directly from the apostles themselves to prove that they were modalists and not true Trinitarians. Even the New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia states, and I quote, the formulation of the one God in three persons was not solidly established, certainly not fully assimilated into Christian life and its profession prior to the end of the fourth century. Among the apostolic fathers, there had been nothing even remotely approaching such a perspective, end quote. So the apostolic fathers were those who lived during the time of the apostles and received the teachings of the apostles firsthand. I further proved by the testimonies of both Tertullian and Hippolytus that the Christian majority in Rome was indeed modalistic monarchian in the late 2nd century and in the early 3rd century, and that these early Roman bishops embraced modalism long before the Trinitarian doctrine was fully developed. Therefore, if we are to believe that the Roman bishops succeeded the 1st century apostles, then it makes sense for us to follow the earlier Roman bishops in the line of apostolic succession from Peter, rather than the later bishops who changed their teaching to embrace Trinitarianism. I further proved that the second largest group of Christians were semi-Arians. The New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia proves that Tertullian and Hippolytus were among the semi-Arians who were contending against the modalistic majority. Even Origin of Alexandria is cited as a semi-Arian by both Catholic and Protestant scholars because he taught that Jesus is not the Most High God. In Origin, uh, Contra Celsus 814, Origin wrote, and I quote, that there be some among the multitude of believers who are not in entire agreement with us and who incautiously assert that the Savior is the Most High God. However, we do not hold with them, but rather we believe him when he said, the Father is greater than I. Thus, Origen and other semi-Arians like him in the mid-third century were contending against the multitudes of believers who believe that Jesus is the Most High God. But Origen and the semi-Arians like him refused to believe in the full deity of Christ. Therefore, the only Christians within the first two centuries who believed in the deity of Christ, even into the third century, were the modalistic monarchians and not the semi-Arians who had a subordinate lesser son, and most of them taught that the son was created before the incarnation. Therefore, the only prominent group that believed in the full deed of Christ within the first three centuries were indeed the modalistic monarchians who were being opposed by Origen and the semi-Arian minority. While it is true 
that some of the mid to late 3rd century Christian writers began developing the idea of eternal sonship. By this I mean that a minority of Christian writers began to teach that the Son always existed without a beginning. The majority of the late 3rd and early 4th century so-called Trinitarians were really somewhere between semi-Aryan and semi sibelian theology. Jaroslav Pelikan wrote in The Emergence of Catholic Tradition, volume, volume 1, page 207, that Marcellus of Ancyra, and I quote, proved an embarrassment to Nicene Orthodoxy because he and other Sibelian monarchians were among the signers of the original Nicene Creed in 325. Pelican wrote on page 203 of the same book, all the rest, except five Arians, saluted the emperor, signed the Nicene formula, and went right on teaching as they always had. In the case of most of them, this meant a doctrine of Christ somewhere between that of Arius, Arianism, and that of Alexander, Sibelianism. If Pelican is correct in his assessment, the majority of the bishops who first signed the Nicene Creed in 325 were semi-Arians because they were somewhere between Arianism and Sibelianism. Then Pelican wrote on page 203, yet it was to the doctrine espoused by Alexander of Alexandria that the palm was given by the emperor, Emperor Constantine, and it was in this light of this doctrine that the Creed of Nicaea came to be interpreted. The Encyclopedia Britannica says that Alexander's views appear to tend towards Sabellianism. Under Arianism, the New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia states that in 319 AD, Epiphanius accused the patriarch Alexander of Alexandria of teaching that the Son was identical to the Father. That is modalism and not Trinitarianism. Hence, it is clear that the modalists signed the original creed because it was in harmony with Alexander's teachings. Alexander's views were Sibelian. But unfortunately, the majority of Christian bishops were somewhere between the Arian theology and the Sibelian theology at that time. Therefore, the semi-Arians ended up signing the creed and compromising their views because they did not want to be exiled by the emperor. Of course, there were others who held Sibelian or modalistic views during the Council of Nicaea in 325, such as Marcellus of Ancyra, uh, Eustathius of Antioch, Photinus of Galatia, but the majority of believers were neither true Trinitarians nor true modalists within the early 4th century. I wish I could tell you that the majority of Christians were modalists at the Council of Nicaea, but they were not. They were not even true Trinitarians. Athanasius was in the minority, as well as Eustathius, Alexander, and others that believed in the oneness. In fact, the same Emperor Constantine, who convened the Council of Nicaea through Eusebius and other semi-Arians, uh, were pressured uh, by Eusebius uh, through the emperor, and they were ended up being exiled. In fact, Athanasius and Marcellus were exiled together for denying the deity of Christ. So we had Sibelians, and which was the most closest doctrine towards Trinitarianism by Athanasius, being together persecuted by the Roman Emperor Constantine, who adopted a semi-Arian belief after first adopting the Sibelian belief at the Council of Nicaea. I do not believe my opponent has refuted the historical evidence that I have presented even by the Catholic historians and scholars, such as Pelican and John Henry Newman. I'm going to surrender the rest of my time. God bless you. Church Fathers, 
If we've entrusted them with such vital teaching as teachings as the canon of Scripture and with safeguarding the biblical text and preserving God's Word, then why not trust them when we read it that the Trinity was ancient? The Trinity is apostolic. I find it most unfortunate that Mr. Ritchie spent nearly three, three and a half minutes in his closing speaking about Arianism post-300, which anyone aware of this debate title is aware of is not confident with this debate. If Mr. Ritchie wants to debate Nicaea or what Origen believes about Christ, we can, we can debate that whenever he'd like, separately. And what we did see in today's, in today's debate was a misrepresentation of Tertullian, because Tertullian never said that most believers are modalists or that most embrace that heresy. Instead, he said, instead he said, and he gets perhaps this one, that most were not learned on the doctrine of the Trinity. I was confused. To try and twist this and say that modalists made up the church and that the bishops are modalists is not only an example of poor scholarship, uh, but it's just bad theological examination all around. And against the practice, one Tertullian tells us that these modalists were arising and they were new. Therefore, this was not widespread. And as he tells us, this was not the teaching of the church. Tertullian himself is clear when he tells us that this is not the rule of faith. The shepherd of Hermas is brought forth um, as proved. Um, proof that the shepherd of Hermas explicitly distinguishes between the three persons in the Trinity were given when we show that grieving the Holy Spirit, he works iniquity, neither entreating the Lord nor confessing to him. For the entreaty of the sorrowful man has no power to ascend to the altar of the God, God the Father. We have the Holy Spirit, the Lord, and the God, the altar of God the Father. Three different persons distinguished. Clement, we're told that Clement, um, we're told very often about Clement that he, he, I guess, believed in some form of modalism. I don't see where. Clement says that we have one God, referring to the Father, and one Christ, and one Spirit. I try to explain to Mr. Ritchie the Greek conjunctions placed between the persons distinguished personally. It is then argued that a Trinitarian exposition by Clement, which is chapter 58 of the first epistle, uh, it doesn't exist in most manuscripts. There's one dated in the year 1056. And this, this of course, is an absurd and an utterly false claim with no basis whatsoever. And I, I suggest anyone who would desire to learn about that, the trick is to do quality research. Because I have personally seen copies of the manuscript of Clement dating from the 200, which is housed in Germany in Berlin. You can write a request in at the library months in advance, and you will be allowed to see the ancient documents that are housed in. You will be allowed to see that, particularly this Trinitarian passage. I find it most unfortunate, most unfortunate that heresies try to, I guess, uh, in an anachronistic way, try to... Um, read back into time and, and, and look for things that are significant and try and discredit them by saying, well, we, you know, we can't find this this document in any certain manuscripts, and we can. You can't discredit Clement there. Ignatius. You read a lot about Ignatius. Jesus. There is one God who has manifested himself by Christ Jesus the Son, who is his eternal word. We didn't, we didn't hear that from Mr. Ritchie. Uh, I'm, I'm suspect of the translation he's reading from because uh, eternal is in the Greek. And then it says, not proceeding to from silence, and who are all things please can be sentence. Nothing different or distinct in Ignatius is. Christ is a person distinct from the Father, who was with the Father before time began. This is pre-incarnation. Two distinguishable persons, pre-incarnation, before creation itself. There is only one God. Ignatius affirms the monotheistic stance of the early church and spreads the apostolic message of the Catholic Church. One God manifested in the flesh by Jesus Christ. Ignatius also hammers home that Christ came forth from one Father and is with and has gone the Father. Again, two distinguishable persons in glory in heaven. We heard nothing of substance about the Greek word for mind. Does Ignatius really call Christ the mind of the Father? No. No, that's, I've, I've read certain translations that, that translated as such, and it, they're shy. Do they believe in old theology? No, they don't, but they're bad translations either way. And I suggest anybody compare the way that word is used there to the way it's used in, in the Corinthian epistles or the way it's used among the patristics. It does not literally mean mind at all. Mr. Ritchie and anybody that does believe that needs to study how these patristic 
sources, the biblical sources, use these words. Because nowhere did the nations call Christ the light of the Father. Justin Martyr, we read Justin Martyr tell us. Incredible. God speaks to the creation of man, he tells us. And then he tells us this offspring, numerically distinct, he said. You catch that? Numerically distinct. And, and Mr. Richard wants to debate Justin Martyr, whether he believes that Christ was pre-existent, eternally, inter- eternally, whether he was eternally generated or not, I would love to debate him on that. Any father on that topic if you want. Because Justin Martyr then says, numerically distinct, but this offspring was truly brought forth from the Father, was with the Father before all the creatures, and the Father communed with them. Justin Martyr is an incredible apologist and philosopher. He paints a picture of pre-incarnation existence, if you will, and tells us that God speaks to the creation of man. Conversely, was somebody numerically distinct from himself, and also irrational being. Again, pre-incarnation. This offspring, he tells us, was with the Father before all creatures, and the Father could meet with him. But let me ask the audience one thing. How can you be in the Greek word koinonia, communion? How can you be in communion and be in communion with yourself? It cannot be in reference to one. I understand that in English it sounds silly. In Greek it is even more nonsensical. And there, there are no exceptions to it, none the way koinonia is employed. It is an impossibility. Let us sum up what the great Justin said. Actually, let us sum up what the rest of the Father said afterwards. In that case, we see a complete distortion of what he said. Calling Christ Father is not equivalent to calling Christ God the Father. Christ is called Father and Spirit. Let us differentiate it from God the Father and God the Spirit. Let us please examine what the text is saying. Let's not deceive what we're told Oh, Christ is Father. I had to run with that and say, oh, look at that, Christ is a Father. What a heretic not that this must have been. Letter of God needed charity. We need to read the text, go back to the original language, read them in their context. The only time we read any semblance of modalism in the Apostolic Church is to denigrate it as a heresy and a theological novelty of the day. And that will sum up the rest of my time, and I think... Mr. Ritchie, for his, his debate, his time, I thank us for being a great and impartial moderator. Thank you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Once again, another great debate. I, I actually like this one a lot better than the last one. Um, those of you who are listening online, if, you, if you're going to participate in the Q&A, if you even suspect you might, <laughs> dial in the number 347 347- Nine three four zero three seven nine three four seven nine three four zero three seven nine. At least that way you'll be in queue. And then, if you want to ask a question, you can press one at leisure. But you need to get into the studio. That is the phone studio where I can see everybody's phone numbers. If you uh, suspect you might want to ask a question, and you're just right now in doubt, but you want to at least be able to ask them because we only have eleven minutes left on this program segment and after that 11 minutes expires anybody who tries to call in to be a part of the QA will be unable to do so and only the ones that are right there in the queue will be able to ask questions that have already dialed in so um, I already see someone pressing one so if you do have a question for either Mr. Ritchie or Mr. Albridge, just uh, press one, and the number is three four seven nine three four zero three seven nine. Press one, and uh, so we have one person. You can have either a question for both or for one of them. Just uh, direct your question, please. Uh, caller number five seven three. You have a question or something you want to share? Can I make a, a comment and question? My name is Manuel. Um, yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I think it's interesting, Mr. Albert um, talked about how these people that were in the majority were startled at the three-in-one dispensation, and somehow they're Trinitarians. I find that kind of funny. That's my comment. And then my question is a biblical comment in uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 32, 
only the Spirit, uh, both of them can address this passage if they'd like. Um, the Holy, Holy Spirit can be blasphemed, but the Son cannot be blasphemed. Um, can both of you address that, please? You want to I want it first. Uh, do you want to go first, Mr. Rich? Uh, or I will let you go first you because first? I, I think whatever, that the question is directed. Like, I, mind. I think the question is directed towards you, Mr. Albrecht. No, no problem. Um, actually, the Son of Man can be blasphemed against. Uh, it, the verse never says the Son of Man cannot be blasphemed against. Uh, but again, an interpretation of uh, Matthew twelve thirty two, which reads, "Anyone who speaks the word against the Son of Man will be forgiven." But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. I know a number of fathers had um, very different interpretations of what that verse actually meant. I know uh, uh, one very interesting interpretation, and, and I, I tend to see a very good point in it, uh, was from Athanasius. You can also find it in uh, Ambrose, I believe. It's, their interpretation of this verse was, Anytime you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, it's basically anything that is, uh, I guess, uh, spoken to the Holy Spirit. Uh, Athanasius referred to the canon being um, distorted and being taken apart by the Arians because of the way they were uh, mutilating certain books and misinterpreting certain things. He, um, he interpreted that as blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Um, Ambrose did the same, and Jerome interpreted that as well as uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit being taking words out of the Bible which, uh, as we know very well, was uh, prevalent in that early, early era and led to um, certain councils convening to probably the canon of Scripture. But again, there can be many interpretations for what the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is, but this text never says that uh, you cannot blaspheme against the Son of Man. just want to be clear on that. I think the passage uh, is def definitely differentiating between the man Christ Jesus the Son of God, and blaspheming the Holy Spirit uh, as the Spirit of the Father. Uh, so it, it is definitely making a, a distinguishment between the two, the Father and the Son, uh, so that, you know, if you, 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 there's a definite, it just shows the true humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, that, you know, you can blaspheme the man, but you can't blaspheme the deity of the Spirit working through the man which is the Spirit of the Father. If I may just uh, add my little, uh, I guess, two cents. <laughs> I believe that the reason why, and uh, I think the, the, the issue of the text is, of course, that one can't be forgiven for blaspheming the Holy Spirit, yet one can be forgiven for blaspheming the Father and the Son. And it, it may have something to do with the role of the Holy Spirit in our salvation as mm -hmm. the revealer of and so um, at least uh, my little spin on this, so I guess my little two cents would be is the reason why I believe people probably the passage just speaking of cannot be forgiven for blaspheming the Holy Spirit is the fact that he is the revealer of truth and those who misrepresent his revelation of truth is of course once again um, misrepresenting God's uh, extension of salvation to others and so uh, I don't know what exactly is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit I, I, I envision maybe false prophecy could be blasphemy of the Holy Spirit but um, once again it will have to be something that is specifically revealed by the Holy Spirit because I do know that um, some people have been you know have committed false prophecy like Harold Camping recently and yet um, have really really come to true repentance like Harold Camping did before he passed away uh, that's just my little two cents on that. Uh, we do have another caller who's calling in. Uh, caller 830, you on there? You have a question for both of these gentlemen? Yes, I have a question. Can you explain the difference between the Son of Man and the Greek article? Okay. Um, the, the, the speaker was breaking up a little bit there, yes, but I, I, I think I caught them. Um, exactly what the question was. Yeah, um, actually, yeah, that actually connects with Matthew uh, chapter 12, verse 32, I believe was brought up right now. I, actually, that's a fantastic question, because I brought up the Greek article a number of times in the debate, and that actually goes right back to this, this I don't remember the name of the caller right now, asked uh, exactly what Matthew twelve thirty two was saying, and it, when I bring up the Greek article, it's particularly important, because it is speaking of... Um, Actually, it's speaking of a person in the, in the times when 
I brought it up, and uh, particularly differentiating between two different persons. And I just opened Matthew twelve thirty two in the Greek, and it's funny that um, a moment would uh, ask a question in regards to this verse, because uh, the Son of Man is a different person. In the Greek, it's differentiated here. Again, we see the Greek article, the Son of Man, differentiated from the Holy Spirit. We've got two different persons here. Um, so the modeless interpretation would not be valid at all here. Not two different modes, but two different persons are here. And that brings me right back to what um, the caller was asking about. Uh, why is it knows that thing with the Greek article? Well, the Greek article is important because it Ignatius, uh, Justin Martyr, Clement, uh, Matthew Cates, all of the fathers, Clement that I brought up, uh, when they're talking about Father, Son, or Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, it's impossible for them to be referencing modalism or different modes of being because these individuals are differentiating between different persons in the Greek by, by either using the conjunction Greek chi or using the Greek article to show that they're different persons. So a modalism really has no foot in the early church, or as we just saw right now in the Bible at all, either, because biblically speaking, historically, there's just really no leg that they have to stand on. I hope that answers your question. I'm sorry for going a little off. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Uh, we're down to the last three minutes before our last two hours, so if you're going to ask any questions and you're listening via archives link or on uh, iTunes, uh, dial in the number 347-934-0379. I do want to get this across before we elapse in our time of three minutes. Um, I mentioned earlier that the person that we sponsored, uh, Tanya Locklear, has passed away, and um, she was a mother of two children, a beloved wife to her husband, and uh, we have a GoFund link, so go to GoFund.com backslash uh, GoTanya, and um, try to help support this family and their loss now, which uh, this would uh, naturally still help with their medical expenses, but also now the funeral costs for the Locklear family. So please um, uh, go ahead and donate to the GoFund website, uh, hearing her passing just last, just last night. All right, um, caller 573, you are on the oh, air. Yeah, I, I just yeah, called, I, and, and I realized I didn't complete the question, <laughs> and I'm sorry about that, but you're right. The Son of Man can be forgiven, but the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven for blasphemy. And yes, I was making a distinction, and I, I don't consider myself modalist, I consider, my, consider myself oneness, because okay. most of you would have named the Secretarian Dorian's oneness based on the use of mode of beating me to God, so I don't consider myself a modalist. Okay. But anyhow, um, uh, the question, and what it does is it doesn't help Trinitarianism, in my view, because God is God, and God would be blasphemed. And there is a distinction between the man yes. and the God, and that's, that was the distinction right. that was, I was trying to make. And, and I knew Brother, Brother Richie would see that, and that's exactly the answer that he gave. So thank you very much. That, that, that was informative. I don't know what to comment on that. It was very informative. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I don't mean to sound rude. I'm not trying to sound rude, but I, I think that the caller is, is confused again. I understand what he's trying to say, but again, the text is differentiating between two different persons, and I understand that the individual is oneness, but, you know, unfortunately, the, the Greek text doesn't support oneness theology at all either. Um, that's correct. Whoever is speaking word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven them. And as I said, there are several different interpretations that have been given down the line about that passage. But um, in which way we come around to it, we, we find that this does not support modalism in any way at all. Well, I, I think it does, uh, because because it doesn't speak of the Son as a separate, distinct, divine person. It speaks of the man, Christ Jesus. So every time we find the one God is the only true God, the Father, John seventeen three, and the man, Christ Jesus, is a, a God existing in a new existence that he never had before the Incarnation. That's why Methodius and others said that, this, that today he's called the Son. 
before he's called the Father, before he is the Spirit of God. And that's exactly what the Shepherd of Hermas taught. The pre-existent Holy Spirit is the Spirit that was incarnated as the man Christ Jesus. Not God with us as God, but God with us as a fully complete human being, which is a different mode of existence that God never had before the Incarnation. So the Son is the man, and the Father is the God, who is the only true God the Father. So Jesus is the arm of Yahweh himself revealed as God with us in a different new existence as a man with a human spirit. And that's the whole Trinitarian confusion is that they see another co-equal divine person, but that's not what the scriptures speak of. They speak The scriptures speak of one God the Father. God the Father, God the Father, over 30 times in the Greek New Testament, but it never yeah, says God the Son. That, 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 that is modalist theology. I understand that's modalist theology, but the, the, the text doesn't say that, that Christ is today the Son. It calls him the eternal, eternally, and it refers to him as being the incarnate Son. Today it calls him the eternal Son. And, and again, you, you, you brought up the arm of Yahweh, and I know we have very little time today, but one interesting thing is there's not a single song in the One of the problems with church history is that I'm a, I'm a oneness believer, so if I find a book written by the Watchtower uh, Bible and Tract Society, I'm not going to be interested in making copies of that. If anything, I might want to destroy it. And that's what happened. That's why we do not, do not have the writings of the Roman bishops who were modalists. It's interesting we have the writings of Tertullian. We have the writings of uh, Hippolytus. Uh, we have so many more writings of this, what, I, what the, even the New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia states are semi-Aryans. They, it calls Tertullian and, and Hippolytus semi-Aryans because they weren't true Trinitarians. But we have their writings, but we don't have the oneness writings because the oneness, modalist writings were destroyed because they did not want to copy them. That's why it gives the Trinitarians a little bit of an advantage because you find, oh, this declared heresy over and over again because all the writings that were saying that the semi-Aryans were heretics are destroyed or lost for the most part. Not always. We have a little glimpses of information from, unfortunately, I had to quote from both Tertullian uh, and Hippolytus to show that the early Christian Roman bishops were oneness. I didn't have their own writings because... Obviously, if they were heretical, the Roman Catholic Church would have been interested in destroying those documents. And that's where Mr. Ritchie does not know what he's talking about, because Tertullian and Origen and Arius were declared heretics by the Catholic Church later in their lives. He perhaps has never heard of Originism, and guess what? The writings still exist. There is no evidence that one of modalist writings were destroyed. That's mere speculation. If you can provide the evidence, well, maybe we have a case. We've got loads of heretics, a lot of them. We still have their writings that exist today. Tertullian is not considered orthodox. His writings weren't destroyed. Arius, definitely not orthodox. His writings still some still survive. Origin, the same, same way. So the claim that all oneness, or well, a lot of their writings... Well, I'm not saying all. No I'm not saying all. Well, there's no evidence. Um, um, I, well, uh, by the way, the, the echo is actually coming through William's phone. I don't know. You have a phone and a mic on. Oh, I'm sorry. But is it still pretty bad? The echo, the echo that we're all receiving is actually coming through your line. Oh, I still want okay. you to know that, William. Um, and I just we, we've passed the two minute, the two hour segment. So everybody that is in the queue right now are the only ones that can ask questions. Just letting you guys know. So um, we do have somebody uh, pressing one. So we'll continue this as long as our two and a half hours so, allotted up. Uh, Ninety seven, you're on the air. You have a question or comment? Uh, I want to say that uh, uh, it's Mr. Richie. Uh, wait, uh, 
not all uh, modernists explain uh, the um, eternality of the sun the same way he does explain it. Um, there are other groups of uh, modernists who believe that uh, the God Angel became the, the God Angel became the God Man. So um, uh, Mr. Ricci doesn't emphasize that view. And then the second observation, I want him to comment on that because I believe that uh, somehow uh, the one is still uh, have they have difficulty to prove that uh, Jesus Christ wasn't he he he, he, he was not eternal or or they, they believe that he's eternal, uh, but they say that he was not literally there with the Father. So I want him to comment on that because some. I think the better one this position is that he had some spirit form called the God Angel that became the God Man. And then secondly, I want us to examine also the question that who is coming back? Is it God the Father or Jesus Christ? Because there is another big uh, issue that we can do. Because there are scriptures that say that Jesus will come. And from the Old Testament, it says that the ancient of days will come. So, and then what is the distinction between the ancient of days and Jesus Christ? Thank you. Oh, that was that. Okay, yeah, okay. that was a bunch of questions. Yeah, there. it didn't come in quite clear, but I will do my best. Did, did you get that? I got most of it, uh, the first portion. One is I, I think, I, I think one is Pentecostal. The first one was oh, about answer? God angel becoming the God man. Are you familiar with that? Uh, well, that part of the question, we, well, we certainly don't believe God was an angel. Uh, never was an angel. Um, God is not a, a, a created person. Jesus pre-existed as the Spirit of God. That's exactly what the Shepherd of Hermas taught and what the early modalists believed in. He pre-existed not as a eternal son or an eternally begotten son because the scriptures are clear that the son had a beginning and a begetting. It says in Psalm 2, 7, you are my son this day have I begotten you. Hebrews 1, 5 says, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. So the father and son relationship had a beginning. And so God was not always literally the father of the son, but in the mind, the logos, the plan of God, and like, I wish I had time in this debate, but so many of the, what even the New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia states, they were semi-Aryans. Even the Trinitarian founding fathers, such as the what, semi-Aryans like Tertullian and others, they taught that the son was in the heart of the father as the Lagos, but when God got ready to create the worlds and to redeem mankind, that he begot his word. And Tertullian said, Tertullian said, uh, when God said, let there be light, he begat the word, and the son had a beginning then, but he was not always the son. But the semi-Aryans believed that the, the son was in the heart of the father. Well, we want us believers say the same thing. In the mind and heart of the omniscient, all-knowing God, the Son was could have been always with the Father because God is omniscient, all-knowing. He could have always been with the Father just as God's elect because he foreknew us. 1 Peter 1.20 says the Son was foreknown. And even the shepherd of Hermas, as I pointed out, said that the church... I forgot, Vision 2, I believe it was. The church was created first. The woman was symbolic of, 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 uh, the, of the church that appeared unto Hermas, perhaps in visionary form. And that woman was the church created before all things. Well, we know that we were not literally created before all things. It was in God's heavenly blueprint. Before, when, when a man wants to make a building, he has to have a blueprint. So God already expressed his word, his wisdom, to govern the universe. And it was that wisdom that he used to create the world and to redeem mankind. Was I too long? No, no, okay. no, that wasn't. Okay. Um, actually, uh, I do have a question related to that, that caller's question. Um, and that is, uh, he was talked about what, what do... Uh, what do the oneness position hold is coming back? Is it that your position that Jesus was begotten the day that he was born as a man? Then if, if Jesus is, if Jesus Christ is the humanity portion, I guess here, that is he is man, um, does that mean that uh, he will, the, the Christ that is returning will once again be the father as a man? Oh, 
Well, the scripture says in Colossians 1.15 and Revelation 13.8, just as the Lamb was slain from the creation of the world, so the Son was already first born of all creation before the world was even created. Not born twice, not literally slain twice, but just like a heavenly blueprint, God calls the things which be not as though they already were. So the Son was already begotten, in a sense, in God's prophetic mind and plan to redeem mankind. He was foreknown before the creation of the world. And so Jesus Christ literally became the Son when he was born at Bethlehem, just like God's elect. We were foreknown too. But And God even foreknew. He actually spoke to Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. So in God's transcendent mind, he already knew God's elect, but God's elect didn't literally exist like Origen taught. Origen taught the, the pre-existence of souls, that we, we were literally alive back then. Right. But no, we, we, don't, we don't believe that we were literally alive. Neither was the son actually the son until he was begotten in history. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to say that sounded a little bit like Origen's um, um, teaching on pre-existence. Um, no, we don't believe that. Yeah. Uh, hey, can I just make a uh, comment? Will you want to make any comments on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're able to hear me clearly, right? Yeah, but there's an echo, so I'm just, uh, I, I think what it is is that whenever anybody still an echo else now. Talks, still have an echo now? Uh, no, no, I don't hear the echo no more. I guess okay, I okay. Well, um, my comment uh, in regards to the modalist, uh, I, I, I understood the question of asking about the uh, eternality of the sun, and uh, I, I am aware of the way the modalists, modalists explain the eternality of the sun, and um, I disagree with uh, Mr. Rich's interpretation of Tertullian. I just wanted to comment that uh, in regards to the... Um, saying that the, the, the son, as the incarnate son, did have a beginning. I know a number of scholars and, uh, seem to be divided, seem to believe that um, Tertullian believed the son did have a beginning, and then some believe that he did believe the son was eternally generated. I, I fall on the side of those that believe that he did believe in the eternal generation of the son. I think he makes that clear in his writing. Excuse me. I think the same can be said of Justin Martyr. And, um, and that brings me right back to my point, and then the biblical text and these patristic texts. And uh, I think that is why language is so so important. You know, we see we see Hermas interpreted. Uh, he interpreted the church in a symbolic manner, and Mr. Ritchie is correct there. But one thing that I would like to point out for people that listen, and I, I hope they go to the documents, is that um, he doesn't interpret the Son, the Spirit of the Father, in symbolic ways, and he does interpret them in uh, as different persons. So going right back to that verse in Matthew 12, I believe it was Matthew twelve thirty two, we don't have different modes being referenced here. We have different persons being referenced here. And I, I think when we speak of the eternal generation of the Son, we see the early fathers that spoke of this. Um, they're really, they're, they're extremely clear that the Son did not pre-exist at the, um, I guess, at the mode of Christ or at the literal arm of, I mean, of God, of God the Father, that is. Okay. Uh, we, we see a lot of symbolic, excuse me, let me just finish, we see a lot of symbolic language used, but we see that they did believe that the Son was a different person, and I think that is key to this debate. If you can show that there's a different person in a pre-incarnate description, that, that destroys modalism completely. Well, I, I can show against Praxis chapter 7 that Tertullian believed an Arian type theology. And against Praxis chapter yeah. 7, then therefore does the Word also himself assume his own form and glorious garb, his own sound and vocal utterance. When God said, let there be light, Genesis 1-3, this is the perfect nativity, meaning birth of the Word, formed by him, the Father, first, he became his first begotten Son. This kind of language proves that, that Tertullian was Arianizing. He was not speaking about a co-equal, co-eternal Son who always existed. He, the, he taught that the Son existed in the mind of the Father, just like we do, but unfortunately, he taught that the Son was created when God said, let there be light. That's an Arian-type doctrine, not a Trinitarian doctrine. Actually, that's, that's, yeah. a, that's a, and, and, I, and here, I, I'm in the q and I can become a little bit unbiased. Um, <laughs> that, I think that's a misnomer because, um, uh, of uh, actually of what Tertullian is saying, uh, and, and 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 perfectly as actually being a former Jehovah's Witness and dealing with Proverbs chapter eight verse twenty two through thirty two a great deal as a former Jehovah's Witness and as one who counters the Unitarian position now on that passage. Um, wisdom theology, that's wisdom Christology, actually teaches that that um, what what you just said that, that at the at the birth of creation Jesus was born. Now born or birth does not intimate. A creation, and I think that's the that's that's misnomer that Unitarians make. That uh, birth actually, birth actually just in, intimates what it is. Uh, the birth of a woman is not uh, a cessation or 
creation, a woman, when she gives birth, uh, still has a baby within the womb, and the, birth, the baby's still alive and well in the womb. But at birth, the baby goes from inside the womb to outside the womb. And so the God monogenates, intimates a uh, born one, that is one that was within, is now existing out. And so when, when uh, uh, Jesus is the spoken wisdom and word of God, wisdom applied in Proverbs 8.22, The problem I, the, in, a, in, in agreement with you, Mr. Ritchie, I would definitely say that the fathers are um, uh, divided on the eternal sonship of Christ. The, the problem here is that I, I think even the New Advent would, Catholic yeah. Encyclopedia admits that Tertullian was a semi Arian under Arianism. Uh, it lists seven church fathers, and, and Tertullian being one of them. Uh, Cardinal Newman uh, very clearly states, speaks of the of Tertullian's doctrine as semi-Arian. And again, uh, the text says, formed by him first. Formed by him first, he became his first begotten son against Praxis chapter 7. That doesn't sound like a, a son that has always been a son throughout eternity past. So that's that's the problem. In the incarnate sense, he believed that he he became son in, in that sense, but uh, he did believe the son was eternal. He says it himself in uh, in his original language in chapter thirteen. Well, the son is uh, is a uh, priest uh, forever, so the son was made to be forever as a man. So he is eternal because he's made to be the eternal priest. Uh, uh, having known uh, having known professors at uh, Catholic University of America and one professor who was the associate dean there and once told me this as far as referencing the Catholic Encyclopedia or other Catholic literature is um, that, you know, Catholic literature can be wrong. 
scholarship can be wrong in, in their assertions and assumptions, and that either, if anyone tries, if anyone tries to use um, any piece of Catholic literature to describe Catholic theology, the only piece of literature that they can use that truly describes Catholic theology in completion is the Catechism. That's um, correct. Yeah. Anything. Anything else uh, is not really authorized. Um, well, and that and that's is truly Catholic as far as this is what the church represents. Um, even a Catholic encyclopedia, even though it is an encyclopedia by scholars in the Catholic Church, yes. it cannot really uh, say definitively this is what the church represents. These are the opinions of some scholars in the Catholic Church, but uh, and they, they could be wrong. They could be wrong on their well, assumptions. I just want to comment. I'm amazed, though, at the scholarship of the Catholic Church being Trinitarian, how honest, intellectually honest they are. And I, I, oh, yeah. I've been thoroughly enjoyed reading Jaroslav Pelikan, uh, Emergence of Catholic Tradition. I'm sorry for not putting no, all the Pelican, footnotes Pelican was Orthodox. But, uh, oh, well, we are uh, down to, like, the, the last couple of minutes. And so I just, anyway, it was a very invigorating debate, very edifying debate. I really, really enjoyed you both um, sharing your views, and um, uh, I know I don't know when this thing might knock off, and so I just I just want to cut it right now. But uh, Mr. Ritchie, you are just uh, welcomed at, at all the time to come and share share your views here, and to um, to go ahead and uh, uh, participate in the debate. If there's anything else that you gentlemen or somebody else that you want to debate on, both of you men have. Um, a free reign to use Healing Ace Outreach as a platform. I really um, have enjoyed uh, both of you in this debate. I had a great debate. time. Two second debate. Yeah, it's really, really good. And um, and I just thank the, the spirit in which you both operated in this debate. And um, I took a lot from, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. And I learned a lot from Mr. Ritchie about the uh, modalistic position that I still, you know, I still don't know into completion. So, um, it was really edifying for me uh, on, I, both, on both on uh, both steads. I enjoyed this too. Uh, those that are very listening, good. Uh, we do have a program tomorrow at four o'clock Eastern time, and it's going to be based on Father's Day. And and it's, and it's amazing because this debate is probably right and long and theme with Father <laughs> Father. Yeah. Uh, yeah, tomorrow's That's Father's correct. Day. I'm actually going to be preaching a little bit on um, the Eternal Father, <laughs> Isaiah nine six. And, um, and so, um, uh, uh, this is really, uh, I think, great timing for this debate. Uh, and next week, we're going to have Carl Mickens, a former Jehovah's Witness, man who knew many, many people at the, at the headquarters of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And so that's a retelecast program, but it's a retelecast program that, if you haven't heard, is really, really worth listening to uh, about learning the the uh, intricacies of the leadership of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Um, without further ado, I just want to wish everyone a happy Father's Day. And, uh, you know, just uh, go ahead and you know, buy, your, buy your dad something else other than a tie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, gift cards are always great, um, and um, and let's not, let's not forget, you know, really Father's Day is not just about our paternal fathers, but about our heavenly Father. Amen. We just um, want to honor Him and glorify Him in all that we do. So you all have a great weekend. Happy Father's Day, and uh, pray for those in Carolina who have um, died a, a awful tragedy oh, in yes. the church there that uh, people were just uh, gunned down and it's people inspired by the devil. Just, terrible times, uh, especially for being a Christian. Yes. Um, and so uh, you all have a blessed weekend. Bye-bye. You too, Mr. Augustine. God bless.